little Van Morrison there from Astral Weeks. Uh, yeah, so in the Times today, they've got an interesting story about who Robert Mueller and his prosecutors are. You know, this takes me back to when we would talk about Starr going after Clinton, right? Who are the people uh, involved in this kind of a thing? Um, Zebley, Zelensky, Ahmad, Andres, Atkinson, Dreben, Goldstein. Robert S. Mueller III, the special counsel, has marshaled prosecutors, FBI agents, and other lawyers to investigate Russia's 2016 election interference and whether any Trump associates conspired. The team has secured indictments against dozens of people and three companies. One trial conviction and a handful of guilty pleas in the highest profile political inquiry in a generation. This is from the New York Times today by Noah Weiland, Emily Cochran, and Troy Griggs. The pub date is November 30th, 2018. So, the team has secured indictments against dozens of people in three companies, one trial conviction, and a handful of guilty pleas. That's one of the ones we talked about yesterday, Cohen. Uh, in the highest profile political inquiry in a generation. Now, by that, I think we're talking about the Clinton one, are we not? This week alone, Mr. Mueller and his prosecutors accused Paul Manafort, President Trump's former campaign chairman, of breaching his plea deal and secured a guilty plea from Michael D. Cohen, Mr. Trump's former personal lawyer. We talked about that yesterday. Each of the core prosecutors has a specialty, like political corruption, hacking, or money laundering, many of which have featured in the indictments in question here. They come from familiar places, the Justice Department's criminal division, federal prosecutors' offices in New York and around Washington, and a law firm where Mr. Mueller worked. The makeup of the team has shifted as prosecutors and others have departed, and some aspects of the investigation are wrapping up. Here's a guide to the key prosecutors and what we know so far about the cases they worked on. So then they list the team and they talk frankly about that. So you may want to take a look at uh, that in the New York Times today. The Merck, I need to go ahead and subscribe to the Merck if I'm going to continue doing this show because I want to read the Mercury News. I prefer it. Um, the San Jose Mercury News. I guess they just call it the Mercury News now. But the Merc is talking about the weather still. It is raining in the Bay and has been, and there have been storms. Um, so they're talking about light rain and colder temperatures in the Bay. Stanford wrestlers sexual harassment case about the coaches uh, ignoring harassment. Um, so that's kind of a weird thing. Uh, snow, they're getting snowfall up in the, in the mountains, so skiers are getting excited about that. California Highway Patrol said a Tesla driver suspected of DUI might have had autopilot on and been asleep at the wheel. A 45-year-old Los Altos man who was asleep while behind the wheel of a Tesla Model S on Highway 101 early Friday in Palo Alto, was arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence of alcohol. It appears the driver had the Tesla driver assist, or autopilot, engaged at the time he was pulled over, but the CHP needs to complete its investigation until making a final determination. About 3.30 a.m., a CHP officer noticed a Tesla driving south on Highway 101 near Whipple Road, out there, at about 70 miles an hour. The officer pulled along the Tesla and noticed the driver appeared to be sleeping at the wheel. The officer pulled up behind the Tesla and turned on the patrol's car lights uh, and siren in an attempt to wake him up. The driver did not respond. The CHP officer drove in front of the Tesla in an effort to slow down the vehicle. The officer believed that if the Tesla's driver assist function was operating, the car would slow down when it sensed a vehicle in front of it, Montiel said. At the same time, another CHP officer was doing a traffic break behind the Tesla to stop other motorists from traveling past the Tesla. So now, two officers are surrounding a robot-driven vehicle with a drunk, passed-out man in the <laughs> driver's seat is what we've come to in Silicon Valley area. Uh, the Tesla eventually came to a stop in one of the middle lanes of 101. Officers woke up the driver, put him in a patrol car, and drove him to a nearby Shell gas station on the Embarcadero in Palo Alto. The driver identified as Alexander Samek, 45, of Los Altos. 
failed a field sobriety test and was arrested on suspicion of driving under the influence. Another officer drove the Tesla to the gas station where it was towed. Wow. Wow. Drunk people in cars turning on the robot and passing out. Take me home. <laughs> and we were asking yesterday whether or not it was inevitable that uh, human beings were going to start toying with the genome and gene editing. No, we're not very bright as a species on this planet. Of course, that's partly a joke. We're the brightest. But we're also, in many ways, extremely drunk is apparently what we are. And let's see what else is going on in the Merc. Rising tide moving against the A's ambitious Howard, uh, I don't know, Howard Terminal in Oakland. I really want the A's to have a new stadium. That would be nice for them. California's top election official defends vote count that Paul Ryan calls bizarre. Now we're talking a lot on this program about the mechanics of voting because I believe a lot of the elections are being fixed. John Wolfolk, who we quoted the other day, uh, has written a piece here. This is a Bay Area News Group piece. California's top election official defended the state's ongoing vote tally Thursday after outgoing House Speaker Paul Ryan called it, quote, bizarre that ballots counted sometimes weeks after Election Day flipped Republican-held congressional seats to Democrats. Ryan, of course, the Republican of Wisconsin, the author of this, um, you may have seen this thing that he's authored the financial thing. Uh, we had a lot of wins that night. Actually, let me give you the full quote. He said during a Washington Post event on Thursday last night that California's election apparatus, quote, just defies logic to me. We had a lot of wins that night, and three weeks later, we lost basically every contested California race, Ryan continued, according to the Post. California Secretary of State Alex Padilla, a Democrat, said in response that it is bizarre that Paul Ryan cannot grasp basic voting rights protections. Uh, it shouldn't defy logic that elections officials are meticulous in counting every eligible ballot. California works to ensure every ballot is counted properly and every ballot is accounted for in the most populous state in the nation and the state with the largest number of registered voters. This takes time. And now, see, that brings us to a very interesting point. The United States of America has a, a, a problem with rushing for a result. That is what caused 2000, the fiasco in Florida. Uh, and the flipping of votes and chads and the whole thing is what counts and what doesn't. Well, we have to decide by this day. We have to know by the time. We'll have to declare. We have to declare Bush the winner. And then afterward, the, oh, my God, so many slimy, slimy, the slime on everybody who's going, well, I'm not saying that Bush lost. Well, I'm not saying that Bush lost. We just have to talk about the, well, I'm not saying they refused to state that they thought Bush did not win because that's a treasonous or seditious statement in the face of an electoral college or a Supreme Court saying effectively he's won. And that's ridiculous. It, it undermined everything, and also it made the Democrats capitulate uh, far to the center more than they ought to have. Uh, and that is what is going on all over the place. When I say that I believe we have fixed elections, false flag operations, illegal wars, and permanent, pervasive, universal surveillance inviting our, invading our privacy, these are all composed of elements that make them true to me. I mean, they're drastic statements, but when you start to take apart each one of them, you see crazy things happening. And taking time to count votes should be obvious in a democracy. Everything should stop until all the votes are counted. Everything should stop until every bit is contested. You can't just decide to chuck out votes because of a deadline, which is what happened in Ohio, uh, when Kerry won, which he did. I mean, I'm not saying the world would be better because if Kerry were president and not Bush's second term, but it doesn't matter to me so much since I am unconvinced that the Democrats and Republicans have that much difference between them in certain key areas. But what we're talking about is it makes it very difficult to believe in a system of uh, elections or want to vote when you don't, when it seems uh, ludicrous how much vote fixing and uh, suppression is going on. But uh, Alex Padilla is defending the state. Uh, a spokesman later clarified to the Hill, right, that Ryan, who is retiring, does not dispute the results, right? You have to say that. The lawyers make you have to say that if you think about it, right? 
So I was a wing nut because I was on the radio. I mean, I was called a wing nut, right? Or I was treated like a wing nut because I was on the radio saying, no, I do not accept that George W. Bush won this election. No. I have reporters on the ground who are reporting to me from Ohio, from North Carolina. I am sitting in a seat where I have a radio station and a network all over the nation. There are reporters calling in and telling me that there's problems right now in this place. And uh, the nation stampeded to re-election. All the networks said, George Bush has been re-elected, George Bush has been re-elected, George Bush has been re-elected. And then any sound against that, any, any statement that sounded even remotely like it hadn't happened, was considered crazy or wingnut or off the thing. Now, two and a half years later, it was proven, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I believe, uh, I forget who it was, they did a thing, and it, it was proven that the Ohio thing was, uh, was fraudulent, and we were right, okay? But now it's far too late. It's two years into the presidency of this guy. He didn't win. So, when I say we need a FICA, a Federal Elections Campaign Act, and we need to revise the Federal Elections Commission. We need to revise it to take into consideration the digital generation and the changes that we have in our society. We need to revise it to ensure that everybody everybody gets to vote and that their vote counts and that they're not tossed out for absurd reasons. No matter how long that takes. What California is doing here uh, and what Ryan is trying to do here, he's retiring, remember, but what, what Ryan is trying to do is cast aspersions on California's vote counting, which went to these Democrats. And California here has taken greater steps to ensure that votes count. And I think more states should be doing that. That's the preferred mechanism. Rather than what we're having is, well, okay, but the time's going to run out, so we, uh, we just throw these out. Or we're not sure whether these count or not. Well, if we're not sure, they just don't count. That's insane. That is not good democracy. Uh, so, again, I'm calling for a Federal Elections Campaign Act. I'd like to see the new Congress. I'd like to see someone in the new Congress author such a thing. And let's go into it and analyze it. Let's put our best minds on that. Let's put our, our you know analytical folks from Silicon Valley onto making sure that the votes are legit and that they count. I, I, I don't see any reason not to make that a high, high priority in a democracy like ours that claims to be one of the best, if not the best, in the world. Um, the world doubts it, my friends. They doubt it because our elections look like a joke. Okay, what else we got going on here? That was the... Merck, we read the Times. Let's see what's happening in L.A. Yesterday we had visitors on this program. This is, of course, the anticlimactic non-show with your host. I don't know who that one viewer is. It might be me. But if it's someone else, feel free to use the chat window to say hello. Uh, we're just looking at the news, which is kind of a fun beginning of the day thing to do. Running through a lot of the different newspapers. Um, here we have... The LA Times, Trump and leaders of Mexico and Canada signed the NAFTA, uh, sorry, signed new trade pact to revise NAFTA, but uncertainty remains. That's Trump using tariffs as a stick in a negotiation with uh, what relations with uh, Mexico and Canada will be like. Someone here says Trump and the incoming president of Mexico are already at odds on key issues. This by Tracy Wilkinson, filed this morning at 3 a.m. Uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, AMLO, the new somewhat left president of Mexico, who has run a couple of few times, and one time declared he himself had not lost and would not, uh, would not quit because he didn't believe the count was correct. That happened uh, two elections past. Has now, he's the former mayor of uh, Mexico City, I believe, has now become the incoming president of Mexico. So the left has kind of taken a spot here. Uh, relations between President Trump and the incoming president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, were always going to be complicated, writes uh, Tracy Wilkinson. 
The question is whether they will become toxic. Trump's threats to close all or parts of the U.S.-Mexico border have antagonized the incoming administration in Mexico City, which takes office on Saturday. This Saturday, AMLO will be the president of Mexico. And members of Lopez Obrador's transition team have sent mixed signals about their own intentions, creating uncertainty in Washington and among investors. The impasse in Tijuana, where several thousand mostly Central American migrants are stuck on the border, poses the first major test of relations between Trump and Lopez Obrador. But there is a long list of potential confrontations. In addition to differences on immigration, Lopez Obrador, a leftist, has hinted he may support legalizing some drugs. He accepts the scientific consensus on climate change and advocates forcefully for human rights, issues that set him apart from Trump. He also wants to shift more of Mexico's trade into Latin America to get out of the U.S. shadow. They are on a collision course, said Eric Olson, an expert on Mexico and Central America in the Washington office of the Seattle International Foundation and Advocacy Group. There are potentially many fault lines. The new government will try will be trying to carve out a position independent of the U.S. Lopez Obrador won his July 1st election with a large majority of the popular vote, giving him a strong mandate in Mexico, and he enjoys wide national approval. This is quite exciting. Despite the insults Trump hurled Mexico's way during the 2016 presidential campaign and his early months in office, the outgoing government of President Enrique Peña Nieto managed to work with the White House. And I think in some ways the fact that he wasn't more, uh, you know, aggressively anti-Trump probably hurt him in the election down there. Uh, but anyway, how this reporter, Tracy Wilkinson, suggests that that this was achieved largely through back-channel diplomacy between Peña Nieto's powerful foreign minister, Luis Vidigare, and Trump's son-in-law and advisor. Hi, welcome, viewers. This is the anticlimactic non-show with your host. It is often anticlimactic, and it is not a show. What we're doing is we're reading stuff out of the papers here at the beginning of the program, and uh, we're talking about a, an article in the LA Times today, which is about uh, Lopez Obrador, AMLO, the new president of Mexico, and how he is going to run into conflicts with Trump and how different they are. Speaking of the previous president, Peña Nieto, uh, working with the White House, Tracy Wilkinson in the Times says, that was largely achieved through back-channel diplomacy between Peña Nieto's powerful foreign minister, Luis Vidigaray, and Trump's son-in-law and advisor, senior advisor Jared Kushner. On some of his dozen trips to Washington, Vidigaray went straight to the White House, circumventing the State Department, and Kushner was crucial in revising a new trade treaty among the United States, Mexico, and Canada to update NAFTA, which was a goal of Trump's. Peña Nieto, whose overtures to Trump helped send his approval ratings into single digits, you see what I mean, will reward Kushner on Friday by awarding him the Aztec Eagle, the highest honor that Mexico bestows on foreigners, will be given to Jared Kushner today, because tomorrow, López Obrador, AMLO, takes over the presidency. Quote, Jared Kushner was extremely important in keeping relations on track, Geronimo Gutierrez, outgoing Mexican ambassador to the United States, said in Washington. López Obrador and the party he leads are likely to look to Latin America for trade deals, looking south, Spanish and other concerns, and may withdraw from the U.S.-backed Lima group of South American countries trying to restore democracy in Venezuela, a pet project of the Trump administration. The Lima group of South American countries trying to bring democracy to Venezuela, huge oil-producing country that is in chaos with its socialist government. For now, the Trump administration is putting out a welcome mat to AMLO, uh, the, she means. Mexico's incoming foreign minister, Marcelo Ebrard, a former mayor of Mexico City, already has met at least twice with Secretary of State Michael R. Pompeo, and they are scheduled to meet again Sunday. Pompeo made a point of stopping to see Lopez Obrador, Ebrard, and other members of their party during a whirlwind visit, whirlwind visit to Mexico City in July. Immigration and trade remain the chief U.S. concerns. The Trump administration wants Mexico to allow migrants to remain in Mexico to await processing of their American asylum claims to no avail so far. Welcome, viewer. This is the Anticlimactic Non Show. We're reading from the LA Times today about the differences between uh, Lopez Obrador, the incoming president of Mexico, and uh, Donald Trump. 
Quote, it's very hard to understand right now exactly where the new Mexican government may be going on immigration, said Roberta Jacobson, who retired in May as U.S. ambassador to Mexico. Trump has not nominated a successor. Now, if I were him, I wouldn't either, right? You want to wait until the new president comes in, I would assume. Peña Nieto was seen largely as helping Washington through a policy critics called detention, retention, and deportation. Carlos Antonio Heredia Zupieta, an analyst at a think tank in Mexico City, said in a telephone briefing arranged by the Wilson Center in Washington, that's the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, with this writer, Tracy Wilkinson. Lopez Obrador is unlikely to follow the same playbook, but his letter, his first letter to Trump was sufficiently positive and lacking in policy detail as to keep the U.S. president on his side. Quote, just spoke to President-elect Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador of Mexico. Great call. We will work well together. Exclamation point. Trump wrote on Twitter on October 3rd. I love when people write, Trump wrote on Twitter instead of Trump tweeted. Because when will journalism catch up to the practical reality of our social media that's taken over the White House? <laughs> Frankly, it's so large at this point. But anyway, Trump wrote on Twitter on October 3rd. Just spoke to President-elect Andres, we will work well together. In a subsequent speech in Miami outlining the administration's Latin America policy, National Security Advisor John Bolton barely mentioned Mexico, focusing instead on U.S. opposition to leftist regimes in Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Lopez Obrador, quote, has been very careful at handling the ego of President Trump and will play that game until something unexpected happens on the border, close quote, said Sergio Aguayo a political analyst at the College of Mexico, a think tank. Aguayo thinks uh, Peña Nieto, either deliberately or inadvertently, allowed the recent migrant caravan to cross Mexico to help Trump with his base before the midterm election as the U.S. president stoked fear by warning of an invasion. We talked yesterday about uh, the Sinclair Broadcasting Group putting out uh, this... T uh, you know, scare tactic story about an invading horde from the South type of deal uh, on hundreds of its stations, right? Radio and television stations. But what it did was it left a, quote, high power bomb for Lopez Obrador. So Aguayo here is saying that the outgoing president of Mexico, either on purpose or by accident, let this thing happen uh, to help Trump with his base. But in actuality, what it has done is left a high-power bomb, he is the way he describes it, for Lopez Obrador. Even a leftist president of Mexico has reasons to avoid antagonizing Trump. Well, duh, the whole world has to not antagonize the U.S. This is the problem we live in, that the U.S. has grown completely arrogant, way beyond its borders. Uh, has been going on for, you know, 35 years now, 40 years now. Uh, quote, there's a difference between doing Washington's dirty work and having an ordered system that tries to recognize migrants' rights while also taking care of your own people, said Earl Anthony Wayne, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico from 2011 to 2015. They are trying to walk that line. Tracy Wilkinson uh, of the L.A. Times today, uh, and you can see that at latimes.com. Okay, so we ran through several bits there of news. We didn't really take a break like we normally do at the 20-minute mark, which would have been uh, about seven minutes ago. So I'm going to put some music on, and we can chill out a little bit, right?